Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started? We can start our introductions while people are still logging in. <clears throat> so hello, everybody. Welcome to Ask the Grant Writing Experts. I'm Dr. Meg Bouvier. You know me as the creator of your library of NIH grantsmanship courses. I have over 35 years of experience at NIH as an applicant, an intramural researcher, a staff writer, and now as a full-time NIH grant mentor. And I've helped clients land over half a billion dollars in federal funding, um, the vast majority of which has come from NIH. And I'm here to answer your questions today. So grab a cup of coffee and let's get started. So um, a couple of reminders, if you are attending live, so you're not looking at this as a recording, but actually attending it live, you are in listen only mode. So um, your video and your um, sound have been disabled. I know somebody just asked that question. Um, so you can type your questions into the Q&A box and your comments into the chat box. So um, we'll be monitoring the questions as we go along. And I know we ended with a question last time about R61, and um, we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Um, but feel free to put other questions in the in the um, the Q and A as well. And if you have something to add to the discussion, feel free to put it in the chat box. And we'll be putting things in there too. If somebody mentions a URL um, or um, you know uh, the contact information for a guest, will be in there as well. If you're watching this as a recording, just a disclaimer that this is recorded on July 26. 2023 and um, everything is true to the best of our knowledge on this date, but things move really quickly at NIH, so you should always confirm what we tell you. So in terms of what you should be viewing, um, it's July 26. Hopefully those of you who are applying to um, fall deadlines are well underway in your preparation stages. So you've um, hopefully drafted an AIMS page and you vetted the project idea and um, you know maybe looked for an optimal NOFO and institute and um, study section and are in contact with a program officer to vet that and have begun the writing stage. So I would say probably watching Master the R series on um, parts uh, one and two would be the best thing right now. Um, so I'd love to, in to introduce our guest today. We have David Widmer back with us today. I'm delighted every time David joins me because he is so incredibly knowledgeable at NIH and he's a, a fellow um, neuroscience PhD. So, um, and his um, contact information just appeared in the chat. So um, his, his um, Gmail address is there, feel free to reach out to him. Um, so David is gonna speak to us today about uh, RA versus RD offices. And so David, go ahead and, and take it away. Okay, I'm going to uh, share my screen if I may. Let's see. And here we go. So I just have a very brief um, introduction about the differences between research development and research administration. Um, first, just a little bit about me. Uh, as Meg said, I did start off as a researcher um, in a neuroscience. And like you, I was a grant applicant and then uh, an awardee and then uh, spent some time pre and postdoc in a lab for six years. Um, but then I moved into uh, what was research administration and became a grants manager. Many of you know what that type of person is and what they do. Um, and uh, you know, I'll go through that a little bit today. But I ended um, the... Uh, section of my career as a research development professional. And that is a kind of new office that I want to talk to you about. It's, a, it's about a couple of decades old. Um, and so some of the institutions may not have such a team, uh, but you might have individual people in your institutions doing some aspect of research development. So again, what is the difference of that? Um, so I just put together a very rough life cycle of a grant. So this kind of gives you an idea of what one needs to do when you're preparing and managing a grant and then hopefully a grant award. So of course you need to find funding 
proposal development, much of what Meg does. There's the administrative stuff that goes around your proposal, your scientific proposal. So the application aspect of it. Then the grant gets submitted. Uh, the award comes through and it is accepted by your institution. And then there's all of the financial management and monitoring and reporting that goes on over the number of years of your award, uh, culminating in a closeout of some sort as your award ends. So aspects of these areas kind of fall into um, three different sections. So you can see by the colors how they're divided up. Um, Pre-awards, very clear, and we'll go over some of the um, aspects of that in the next slide, and post-award as well. The pre-pre-award is what has uh, become known as research development, and I'm going to lean on a colleague of ours at the University of Michigan uh, who has put together the most amazing summary of what RA and RD are. Um, and so this is coming from Dr. Jill Jividend um, at the University of Michigan and thanks to her. So research administration, many of you know what that is and have dealt with people in that area. There's the pre and post award, sometimes that office is combined. You might have somebody doing those things in your department. I'm originally from a central office. Um, someone in that area is the institutional signatory because for federal grants, at least your institution is the grantee. And they are saying, we have chosen you uh, as a PI to successfully uh, do the project associated with this grant. So research administration is very focused on regulations of the sponsor, requirements of that particular NOFO or of that particular mechanism, um, but then also how your uh, institution deals with grants of all different kinds. There are various inside policies. Uh, there is a set submission process. All of those application components that we talked about, someone needs to create the budget. Most of the time it comes from you as faculty, but then gets checked by a research administrator in your department or again, in the central office. Then when the award comes through, there's financial management and reporting. There are certain uh, terms and conditions in your notice of award. You can spend the money on X, but not on this. Uh, there's a limit to travel, for, ex for example, or you must use some of the monies to go to a conference, all that type of stuff. So who is prepping that and monitoring that? Because again, the institution is uh, has has the burden of following whatever requirements are in a notice of grant award. Um, at the bottom, you'll see compliance. This is actually an aspect of grant applications that kind of get lost until the very uh, days just before a submission. So. Are there requirements to pre-review a protocol if there's human subjects and have some sort of uh, statement that, yes, this protocol is has been reviewed or will be reviewed during a just-in-time process? Your grants manager, your research administration person needs to keep track of that and work with you to respond to it. That, that has to do with any type of research subjects, animals, um, uh, human subjects, 
what what are the uh, uh, salaries that are associated? Are they above the cap, below the cap? Cost sharing, all of that stuff is research administration. But research development, as I kind of tagged it at the beginning, at the prior slide, is neither pre-award nor post-award. It's sort of pre-pre-award. It is the uh, professionals that will help you be perhaps even before you need to, you know you need to submit a grant. Because if you don't have a support from someone who can uh, look at your um, project funding in a strategic and long-term way, get the larger picture, what is your career stage? Uh, what is a grant strategy that we can put together for you? Uh, starting perhaps, and this is this is sort of an old uh, uh, work through of fellowship, career development award, and research grant. And depending on where you are, you could, may or may not follow that very you know original uh, process for receiving research funding. So it is a long view, um, and there's a lot of development things. There is funding development, and a research development professional will help you. What is out there? What's the landscape of uh, sponsors? And then how does your project match with what a sponsor wants? You need to know that because your grant should respond to that and highlight that. Um, which opportunity from that sponsor? How do I uh, parse and understand uh, sometimes what is a very opaque, opaquely written uh, NOFO? All of these things a, um, a research development professional can help you with. So it's sort of mentoring your career and setting out some milestones that we would like you to hit based on our experiences. And that's one of the things that um, now that I've uh, started a, a company separately is part of what I want to share. The, you know, proselytizing about the importance of research development, of that free free award side of things. Um, so I can answer any questions about more about the differences between the two of them, but that sort of where do I find a sponsor? Where do I find a NOFO? Is it the best for me? Um, how do I develop a proposal, which is exactly what you're getting from from Meg and all of her guidance. Um, and then you move to a grants manager or a department manager to create the bio sketches and all of that stuff that goes around your research strategy. So I know I don't have that much time to uh, go on about the joys of, of research <laughs> development and moving uh, from RA to RD as I did in my career. Um, but I did want to just give you a highlight uh, and encourage you to identify whether there are these RD professionals in your institution. Again, perhaps in the department or in the central office. Usually they're embedded in the office of the VPR, uh, Vice President for Research. Um, and sometimes like in my institution's case uh, in the central office research administration as a pre-arm of research administration. That's great, so, David. I think yeah. there's a lot of confusion about this. And I can say that um, just even thinking of it from, I, I often have to think through the differences between these as well, because it's evolved so much since we've since you and I have been doing this. Um, but um, for people who are still a little unsure about how this works, one way to think about it, because everybody on this call um, has a contract with my company, 
that contract almost invariably has been set up by the RD office. So they're the ones who are thinking strategically and long range about we're going to offer these virtual courses or we're going to contract with this company for a batch of um, application reviews. Um, and so the RD office is the place where I um, work initially to get the contract set up. But then when I'm actually in the trenches working one on one with an applicant, it's the RA office with whom I'm communicating about coordinating different parts of the application package and the review and you know what their timelines are or when they expect certain sections. So um, just to kind of map it against the processes that um, that that we offer, because everybody on the call has a contract with my company. So um, yeah. So does anybody have any questions about that before we move to um, just general Q and A? So there's um, again for anybody who's joined recently, there's um, a, you're you're in listen only mode. So um, there's a Q and A box. You can put questions in there, and there's a chat box if you have something to add that you want to add there. So and otherwise, I think we're going to just go ahead and start. Um, I know um, we had a lingering question from last time, and I'm mm. kind of chomping at the bit to answer that. So um, and David may want to weigh in on it as well because it's um, it's it's good for. Uh, academic medical centers, um, which is what um, we do a lot of. So um, so a person asked last time, and I apologize, I can't remember who it was, and I really hope this person is on the call, <laughs> but um, this person asked last time about whether um, she should pursue an R34 or an R61, and, and I, um, I deflected and said, check with your PO, but I want to read up on the R61 some more because I haven't worked on one in a while. And um, so the issue... I'm going to start kind of from the beginning about why why does this question even matter. So um, there are there are many pathways to an R01. You know, like you don't typically just right out of the gate apply for a multi million dollar NIH grant. Usually, it's you start with foundation funding or a K award or um, small format R21 or R03, and you kind of demonstrate success on smaller grants. Um, success being publications. Can you can you turn your grant money into some publications? That's the name of the game, right? We all know this. So um, so the problem comes in is if you're um, hoping to eventually propose a clinical trial at the R01 level. Um, so how do you do that, right? Because like the you can't do you can't do a clinical trial in a K. Right, you that typically in a mentored K, even on the K08 and K23, typically you can get um, clinical trial experience there, but you're not running the trial. And RO3s almost universally do not allow a trial because the budget's too small, right? It's usually two years and capped at 200,000 directs over the two years. And um, R21s will often allow a clinical trial, but good luck doing one in the 275K cap in two years. So what do you do for a clinical trial planning grant? What, what are the mechanisms that are available to you if you need more than more time and more money than is available to you at the R21 level, which is two years, 275K cap over two years? So there are two options which were identified by the person asking this question. One is the R34 which is typically used as a clinical trial planning grant at NIH. That's the tip, there, there's another use for it, but that's by and away the most common use for the R34. Typically it's a three-year project and I think it's capped at um, most often at 450,000 directs over the three years. Um, although I've seen it go up as high as 600K. So you have to check your specific NOFO because usually R34s are sponsored by different institutes. Um, but then there's this other option called the R61, which can stand alone or be in a, a biphasic uh, mechanism with the R33. So some of you may be familiar with the R21 slash R33, which is a biphasic mechanism. The R21 is the feasibility piece of it. And then you move on to the R33 where there's a fuller implementation piece of it. But you can do it as an R61, R33. Um, so the R61, 
again, everybody sponsors their own version of it, um, but typically it's one to two years and the budget would be smaller. So if you're trying to decide between an R34 and an R61, in order to lay down the preliminary work to go on to propose a full-scale trial at the R01 level, if you're deciding between those two, First and foremost, you have to figure out if your institute sponsors one of these, right? Because not every institute is going to sponsor one or the other of these mechanisms. I think the R34 is more prevalent than the, the R61. Um, but then the other thing, it really depends on how much time and money you need, because the R61 tends to be shorter. It's one to two years usually, whereas the R34 is typically three years. So for those of you who are wondering, how do I search? I refer to this, um, to this website all the time. I'm gonna do a quick screen share of this website. Hold on a second. So you should be seeing, um, yeah, you, you're seeing this now, this search tool, right? Find grant funding. And I am going in the chat, I'm gonna drop the URL for that. Um, so what you can do is come in here and restrict by um, agency. You can leave it open or you can restrict it um, to NIH. And then you can come in here and search for, um, you would look for the, um, the R34, which is here. So you could click that box and or you can click for the R61 and or you can click for the biphasic R61 or R33. If you're unsure about which to do, I would, I would click all three and see what comes up and um, you know, see if your institute even sponsors the one you're thinking about. Um, and then the other thing, of course, is to ask, always ask the program officer. They're always your, you know, like whatever they say is always the right thing to do. So Okay, and I have a question. Um, so, do, and if anybody has any questions on that, I'm actually thinking of because I'm so intrigued by this. I'm thinking of doing this for. Um, I think I have an open date in early September, um, so I may do a, kind of a deeper dive into the R61 so that people can um, get a better sense of like who sponsors them and what are the different NOFOs like because they can be highly variable. The R34 is is pretty standard. It's usually three years and about 450K. NCI has one that goes up to 600. Um, but the but the R61 seems to be pretty highly variable about whether it's a uh, one or two year and whether it's offered as a biphasic with the R33 or not. So I, I may do a deeper dive into that. If people are interested, let me know. So, uh, or, or if you want another topic, I've got an open date in early September. So <laughs> let me know. And if um, I can just uh, pop in one thing before you go to the next question, uh, uh, I, you know, I think the research development team or office, it can be very helpful in assessing yes, whether yes. one or the other mechanism is yeah. good for you. And then just to add, Meg, to what you were saying about the trajectory, um, one of the things that many institutions have and that research development uh, teams work on are internal grants, seed grants, yeah. limited competitions, mm -hmm. and those might be also, like foundation, a right. good first step. Yeah, so there's like the, um, uh, some organizations have institutional, um, they, they're like mini Ks, so like the K, uh, KL, is it the K? K KL. KL, yeah. yeah. KL2 it is. Yeah, I think it's a KL2 and there's it another one. It be a K12, you know. Yeah, actually, I think that I think they they both exist, and and one of them is specifically clinical or something. I can't remember, but those are like mini K's, and they're meant to um, beef up your eligibility for an a proper NIH mentored K award, which mm -hmm. would be like the the K01, the K08 for clinicians, a K like mm -hmm. 23, you know, the a K9, well K99 R00 is earlier. Um, but it's meant to beef that up and the, and the two combined can't exceed six years. So, um, and, and then the slots that are there, usually are, there's an internal competition right. to say, okay, right. this person is the one to fill yes. X slot. 
Right. So, so in other words, um, your organization applies to NIH for, it's like a T32, you apply for this institutional mentored grant award and you receive funding and you have a certain number of slots and then you've laid out in your grant application how your internal competition will go and the institution right. plugs the people in based on that internal competition, like a T32, if people are uh, familiar with those. So you should always check with the take home messages, you should always check with your organization to see what kind of seed funding they can offer you, because often that's the step before the small, small format um, NIH grant application. So you might have um, like the very first step would be internal funding and foundation funding. Then the next step, might be like a, a mentored K or a small format R, like the R21, R3, R03, R34, R61, something like that. And then it, once you've kind of demonstrated your chops there by landing these, you know, sequentially larger awards, then you come in um, with a little more credibility at the R01 level because you're not a completely unknown quantity at that point. You've demonstrated your ability to land a grant and turn it into um, publications. Okay, so um, as usual, we, we've gabbed a lot. David and I always love to talk about this stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's, no, it's great. I love talking about this stuff. Um, so we have a question. Um, so I recently heard anecdotally of an application where reviewers complained about the balance of content and the research strategy versus the human subjects. It seems they didn't feel enough information was in the research strategy. I love this question. The SF424 says not to duplicate across sections, however. Can you comment on how not to duplicate but provide enough information in the research strategy to appease reviewers? Thank you, Kaylin, so much for asking this because this is like, I, I could go on for hours just on this one question. So yes, it is true that the, the um, the, the SF-424 is really clear that you absolutely are not supposed to duplicate information between what goes in the human, the human, the subjects. human subjects and clinical trial information form and the research strategy. Having said that, in my experience, I can name dozens of instances where reviewers complained about a lack of information in the research strategy that did appear in the human subjects form and not one single instance of a summary statement I have read in the last however many years, and I probably read a hundred of these a year, I have not seen one instance where reviewers said, you shouldn't have put that in the research strategy because it's in the human subjects form. So you go right ahead and duplicate it. <laughs> you didn't hear it from me. But, um, but this is what I advise my one-on-one -on -one people. They, even though it's against the rules, I have never seen anybody be disqualified for this. And I've never seen a reviewer complain when you duplicate the information. So the, the way that I typically handle this is that you have to try really hard to think like a reviewer and think about like, what are the key things that I really need to know to understand the application? And I'm going to give you an example. The eligibility criteria go into section two of the human subjects form. So technically it shouldn't appear in the research strategy. How in the world are you supposed to understand the project wow. if you don't put the eligibility criteria in the write-up? That makes no sense. So what I do as a compromise is to um, have the person list the key eligibility criteria. Usually the eligibility criteria, criteria inclusion and exclusion are exhaustive. You know, they, they, go, they typically go on and on and on. But there are like three or four inclusion criteria that are mission critical to understanding the structure of the project and how you're choosing the people. Um, so, Usually I have them list like the the several that are most important, like, you know, um, maybe like um, that they, you know, demonstrate they, they have a this diagnosis and they're between this, these ages, you know, like you don't have to exhaustively list, you know, like if they if they're not able to read Spanish, English, or like they, you know, whatever, there, there are usually lots more, you know, like if they, you know, whatever, I, I can't think of what else. 
Um, but if it's if it's really truly mission critical to the, for them to, to have that information to understand the design of the project, you go right ahead and put it in the research strategy. And then say for a, for a list of the complete eligibility criteria, you would say this parenthetically, for a complete list of the eligibility criteria, see section two of the human subjects form. Mm -hmm. That way you're like giving them what they need and sending them over to the human subjects form, reminding them that it's there. Um, reviewers, in my experience, don't always look at the form. And they, they don't always look at other sections too, like the post-submission material. So if you plan on putting something in as post-submission material, you might want to say in the application, we anticipate updating this information in post-submission material because they don't always look at that either. <laughs> so anyway, go ahead, David. No, just to say like one of the examples that you just gave, the, you know, they can read Spanish or whatever. You can like bulk some of those things and say, you know, plus the rep criteria of language comprehension and X and X. Yeah. And then you've kind of mushed them in there, but then all of the details are where yeah. they're officially meant to be. Yeah. You can also um, put a text box around it, drop the font size to eight or nine, and then just list inclusion criteria and list them out, you know, and then on the bulk, the ones like you said, and then say for a complete list. And that saves space as well. Because part of and the And it also directs them to where they can find yes. things as opposed to, hey, where is all this information? Right, exactly. So I love that question. That was a great question because it's, I, a lot of what I talk about here is, what is the rule at NIH versus what is typically done and acceptable and allowable and not going to disqualify your application? And often those two things are very different. And there's no way for a person to know that um, unless you ask somebody who has been around for a while. And often your pre-award support people, um, the, the RA and RD folks yeah. can often answer these questions as well. Although that question is from from an from a, a person in a, a in a central office so i really appreciate yeah like it's it's really it's tough to know this stuff because it's not written anywhere anyway we're way over time david and i can talk endlessly about <laughs> <And Joe. laughs> and I mean, weeks. so um so anyway um do email us info at bouviergrant.com for um i'm looking for topics for upcoming sessions david is slated to come back and visit us um, so we'll look forward to that. I think our the end of August and the end of September, if I'm not. Yeah, mistaken. I think that's right. You're, yes, August 23rd and September 20th, David will be coming back. So August 23rd for uh, early communication with grants or compliance offices for seamless submission. And September 20th, admin tasks as you prepare to submit. So, and next week we will have Emily Clemens back from the CDMRP um, portfolio um, because she we had so many questions for her, we couldn't answer them all. So she's gonna come back and answer questions. So, but I'm, I'm um, filling in some holes in the calendar. So be sure to let me know what, what you wanna hear me talk about. So I have a whole, um, a whole list of uh, mechanisms I want to discuss. You know, the DP1 and um, the R15, they're all different mechanisms that I'm planning on discussing too, because um, there are lots of uh, mechanisms besides the R01. So anyway, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and I appreciate you staying on to the end. And thank you, David, so much for- um, Thank you for having me. As always, a joy. Yep. And um, there is a blog post that goes with David's presentation. Yes. So if you check our, um, I think our blog, uh, let's see, is is that in the chat box, the blog? It is. I put it, I put it there. It's uh, bouviergrant.com slash news. Great. Okay. So check back there in a few days and that will be posted. Um, and otherwise, we'll see you next time. Thanks so much for joining Bye, us. Bye, everyone. Good luck. Yeah, good luck. Bye.